September the 11th, 1952. Morning. Cast of characters, five to close the files with. One Latin American to be known as Cholo Martinez, wanted by local and federal agents on both sides of the international border from the Gulf of California to the Rio Grande. One neurotic mother, one very tired stepfather, and one 19-year-old girl whom we shall call Cassandra Lee. An arrested narcotic case with an 18-month history of heroin addiction. And one police officer, myself, Lieutenant David Jason, City Police Department, Narcotics Division. It wasn't until sometime later that morning that I was able to account for the girl's sudden change in behavior. Cassandra hadn't seen Martinez since the day he disappeared in the desert, north of the Mexican border, close to three months ago nor had anyone else. His appearance now was unaccounted for. Why Martinez did show at this particular time and place, only he or perhaps the girl could say, or any other pair of young addicts who had experienced what these two had in recent months. Martinez was still very much at large. But the Lee girl was now involved in the legal process of being transferred to the Federal Narcotic Hospital in Kentucky as a ward of the juvenile court. I'd bet on Cassandra's case from the very beginning. It didn't take too much imagination to figure out who it might be that was tailing us to the station. Code, narco, red. Miguel Martinez, alias Choro. 57140 of Mexican origin. 37 Fort Sedan, south on 42nd Street. Destination, Southern Pacific Station. Approach with caution, you may be armed. Under the circumstances, there was some question as to whether Cassandra would try to make a move to alert Martinez. So I kept her close to me. She now had sufficient reason to hate Martinez. But I still couldn't be sure of what she might do if he got close to us again. Addicts have a strange code of ethics. Somewhere between the time of arrival and departure of the Eastbound Limited that day, the police department would officially close out the file on the Lee girl's case, writing off three years of Cassandra's turbulent past. 
motorcycles were a part of Cassandra's turbulent past. I didn't get the connection at first, but then I began to recall the first implicating circumstances in the girl's case a little over three years ago. It began in the summer of 1949, several weeks before school started. That summer, Cassandra worked as a stock girl in a mother's small downtown place of business. Across the alley, there was a motorcycle repair shop. It was here that Cassandra first became acquainted with Russell Packard and his motorcycle pals, a fast bunch of kids all suffering in various degrees from the same kind of emotional insecurity that Cassandra had been afflicted with during a lifetime of being bounced from the knee of one stepfather to another by a much-married mother. Mrs. Lee's lack of sympathy for the problems of the teenage personality, coupled with the frustration of knowing that she had somehow failed Cassandra as a mother, fomented emotional situations between mother and daughter that played havoc with the emotional stability of both. An offer of sanctuary, unreasonable tirades of reprimand in the presence of her peers. A spur-of-the-moment decision, and the beginning of a dangerous gang association. Later that same day, at an old abandoned stadium just outside of town, Cassandra encountered one of the most damaging aspects of many of today's youthful gang associations. Reefers, marijuana. One of the lesser narcotics whose use often constitutes the first faltering step toward addiction to the harder drugs. And now, as the newest member of this gang of kids to whom the use of marijuana had become the big-time thing, Cassandra found herself the target of one of the most devastating social pressures existing among our teenage population today, conformity to the group pattern. Passing up the reefer meant passing up the gang's bid to really belong. Her refusal to conform would place her in the precarious social position of being with the group, yet outside of its circle of confidence. During her next few weeks with the gang, Cassandra was more or less regarded with suspicion and subjected to subtle ridicule. But she managed to hang on by sticking close to Packard. She rode with the gang, but always somewhat apart from the group, having as yet failed to gain their confidence. passing of time, Cassandra became more accustomed to the kids and their use of marijuana, but never to the feeling of being an outsider. The adolescent personality demands and needs to belong. To belong meant conformity to the group's pattern of behavior. By the end of the following school year, Cassandra's personality had undergone a gradual yet drastic change. She'd become irritable, reticent, and pointedly antisocial. Old friends that she'd once palled with at school now made a practice of going out of their way to avoid her. That is, all but one. A kid by the name of Johnny Adams. The boy who was always seen waiting to take Cassandra home each day after school. Johnny was the fall guy who refused to believe that she had somehow changed. But then, Johnny was perhaps the only person in Cassandra's young life who had a genuine regard and affection for the girl. So Johnny waited. When the last day of school rolled around in May of that year, Cassandra was still flying high. But her scholastic average during her last year of high school had fallen to its all-time low. The possibility of college which had once counted on heavily as an avenue of escape from home and family, was now completely out of the question. Her school days were behind her, and Cassandra was frightened. But there was an out. Johnny was still waiting. Long ago, Cassandra had learned that she could always run to Johnny when things closed in. But time was running out fast, and so was Johnny. Graduating from school with top honors, young Adams had a job with a future waiting for him. And with the blessing of both families, Cassandra's in particular, 
Johnny had never made a secret of the fact that he wanted Cassandra to someday be a part of that future. Cassandra's situation called the play. She was now determined that that certain someday should be soon. And June was just around the corner. and badly maladjusted. Cassandra was ill-prepared for the adjustments and routine responsibilities of married life. By midsummer, her young husband had become the innocent focal point of the girl's accumulated apathy and resentment. In spite of the sedatives prescribed by her physician, Cassandra had for some weeks now been riding the crest of a nervous breakdown. Aware only of the fact that recently his young bride had not been well, Johnny had little insight as to the emotional nature and background of her condition, and with the passing of time was finding it increasingly difficult to account for her frequent displays of mood and temper. Johnny's family physician had diagnosed Cassandra's problem as one of post-marital adjustment. His panacea was a few words of wisdom and a bottle of sleeping pills. Johnny's solution to the problem was equally superficial, being based upon Cassandra's habitual complaint of boredom during the long hours of the day while he was at work. The novelty of owning and caring for a dog did absorb a great deal of Cassandra's time and attention during the next few weeks. But Johnny's dog, like the doctor's sleeping pills, was hardly the answer to Cassandra's problem. Deep within this girl's emotional makeup was an impelling fury of discontent that was immune to medications and momentary diversions of interest.
a period of less than two months, Cassandra had kicked over the traces and pulled all stops. By persistently accusing Johnny of countless personal inadequacies, some real, some imaginary, Cassandra had cunningly unloaded the blame and responsibility for her own misbehavior, including the possession and use of marijuana at the feet of her bewildered young husband. Paralyzed by a guilt complex, young Adams stood by and helplessly looked on while his young wife started down the long road the junkies call the route. Johnny's employer was the first to notice the change that had come over young Adams. On the 14th of October, Johnny was given the day off and sent home to resolve the problem that was interfering with his concentration at work. An overturned trash bucket. The dog, perhaps. In among the tin cans and food cartons, Johnny found half a dozen or more small bottles of a type commonly used by druggists when filling prescriptions. Second all, sleeping pills. And this was the dream. The junkies call them goofballs, and Cassandra was about as goofed up on second all as the physical limitations of the human body can stand. Young Adams knew that Cassandra had been issued a prescription for sleeping pills on several occasions, but he became alarmed when he noticed that the issued dates on the labels of six of the bottles were all within a period of less than one week. It was apparent that Cassandra had now added forgery to a fast-growing list of indiscretions and misdemeanors. She was even now trying to top that list with suicide. There was another bottle of second all hidden behind the incinerator. on a 502, resulting from intoxication created by stimulants of an undetermined origin, Cassandra was held for a short period of observation in the police ward of City Hospital. When medical investigation proved inconclusive, she was then released into the custody of her husband and parents. Telephone call from the Lee home in the middle of the night on November the 2nd wrote Cassandra's name on the police blotter for the second time. This time as a missing person. In the meantime, the name of Russell Packard had come to our attention as a suspect in a small-time dope break. The organization was thought to be operating out of the east end of town. 
by a motorcycle messenger service a la Packard. When we learned of Cassandra's connection with Packard, we tracked the girl down and put a close tail on her. From then on, Cassandra was officially my problem. We were tailing Cassandra in the belief that her trail might lead us to Packard and consequently into the Dope Rings operational headquarters. By late afternoon, it began to look as though our hunch might pay off. She was blazing a trail right into the east end of town. The lead was just beginning to look promising that afternoon when the trail came to a dead end at one of those high-type flop houses down along Skid Row. When I saw Cassandra buttonholing a couple of junkies lounging around the hotel lobby, I realized that she was trying to get a lead on Packard herself. When I walked in, the girl was still asking questions, so I obliged her by answering a few. I told her I'd recently bought some junk from a guy by the name of Packard at a little joint over near 3rd and Main. Offered to drive her there for a look-see. Packard, of course, wasn't there. But the fake lead I'd thrown Cassandra's way bought me into her confidence. When she got back into the car, she told me she had a couple of hunches she'd like to run down. Wondered if I'd mind driving her around a couple of other places. These other places she had in mind were some of the sleaziest joints in town. When she came out of the one they called a club cabaret, I could tell by the expression on her face that she'd gotten the word from someone. The word took us into the old warehouse district down by the river, a section of town where the cops liked to walk their beats in pairs. By the end of the week, Cassandra had turned up as a car hop in a drive-in on the west side of town. Her job there had been rigged by Packard for the big man Packard was delivering for. The drive-in had been staked out by the police department for the past month on suspicion that marijuana was being sold under the food trays. Packard's boss turned out to be a small-time racketeer and bunco artist by the name of Al Stutzman, and now Cassandra was on his payroll, too. Stutzman spent two or three days observing the way Cassandra handled the drive-in trade. Then came the pitch. Cassandra's job in the drive-in was only a proving ground for bigger things. A few days later, Stutzman set the girl up in a swank apartment in the neighborhood of Park Union High School. When Cassandra moved in, we planted spotters in the apartment house across the way and kept the place under surveillance day and night. Cassandra had been recruited by Stutzman to expand his traffic in marijuana. Along with the apartment, Cassandra was given the job of holding open house and playing hostess to the teenage bop crowd from the neighboring high school. But Cassandra was finding it hard to keep her mind on business. The junk Stutzman had given her to sell to the fast crowd from Park Union presented too much of a personal temptation.
Cassandra's weakness for the merchandise she was given to retail periodically put the skids under Stutzman's caper at the apartment house. But in between the girls' recurrent breakdowns, business was carried on as usual. By the end of the month, we had most of the necessary information we needed to pin a conviction on Stutzman. At 4.54 on November the 31st, the apartment house stakeout rang in the code two we'd been standing by for. At 5.09, we closed in for the kill. The raid on Cassandra's tea party miscarried. The minute we hit the front door, someone in the kitchen flipped the switch on the garbage disposal unit, pulverizing the critical evidence we needed for a conviction. We'd fumbled badly, but we hadn't lost the game yet. We still had Cassandra. If she were handled the right way, the Lee girl was a possible for state's evidence against Stutzman. Down at headquarters that evening, I could see that Cassandra wasn't going to buy the reform program that I was outlining for consideration. She knew the evidence we had implicating her was, for the most part, circumstantial. But on the other hand, the girl was smart enough to realize that what little we did have was just enough to make things uncomfortable. She finally expressed a certain willingness to cooperate. I assured Cassandra that she would be given every consideration if she would consent to full cooperation with the department. This, of course, meant not only giving testimony against Stutzman, but also any information she might possess now or in the future concerning other narcotics violations within our jurisdiction. Cassandra wasn't fooling anyone but herself. Addicts have but one loyalty, to themselves and their all-consuming drug habits. When circumstances threaten their freedom to pursue those habits, behavior is motivated by the most primitive of animal instincts, self-preservation and survival of the fittest. The rest of Cassandra's cooperation with the department amounted to an occasional tip-off leading to the arrest of several teenage gangs around town that were still playing the dangerous game. Andrew's probation period expired on the 1st of May of the following year. Regarded now as a criminal by unsympathetic parents, it was no great surprise when Cassandra disappeared from home again on the day following her release. Required to live in the home of her mother and stepfather during the probation period, Cassandra had evidently found little change in the home environment which had compelled her initial flight into the world of drugs and dreams. It was some time during that first week in May that Cassandra's path crossed that of a young woman paying the highest possible tariff in terms of the narcotic route of escape, the heroin addict, suffering from the preliminary symptoms of narcotic withdrawal. The young woman to whom Cassandra was being the Good Samaritan was one Margot Rossi, the wife of a young hood serving a long term in the state penitentiary. Margot had once made the fatal mistake of trying to fill the vacuum in her life, first with drugs in general, then heroin in particular. Now, when deprived of that drug for any length of time, she was tortured by the cruel sickness of narcotic withdrawal. Though from entirely different socioeconomic backgrounds, these two young women had much in common. And built upon this common ground was the beginning of a new and dangerous association. In the weeks that followed, Cassandra and Margot Rossi became not only the closest of friends, but also partners in business. 
Margot had resorted to devious means of supporting her expensive drug habit. One of these had been the retailing of marijuana on street corners for a pandering dope merchant by the name of Sven Bergman, the pusher on whom Margot had become dependent for her supply of heroin. With Cassandra's encouragement, however, Margot had broken with Bergman and the two girls were now in business for themselves. When the word got around town that a couple of girls were dealing in marijuana, Cassandra and her business partner began to realize a monopoly on the local weed market. Junkies from all over town were attracted by the novelty of making their buys from women. The girls had the edge on competition and business prospered, but they had made the mistake of opening up shop on someone else's coveted corner of the cement jungle, namely Sven Bergman's. They had been operating not only in competition with, but in outright defiance of a madman. For any young addict to have known this man was to become his slave, and Margot Rossi had been one of his so-called employees. Reforging the shackles and shortening the chain on one of his renegade slave employees was simply a matter of increasing the mainline jolt of heroin, thereby increasing the slave's dependency upon the master and his supply of the drug. Cassandra had encouraged Margot to break with Bergman. But Margot, unfortunately, had neglected to inform her young friend of the sinister circumstances involving her relationship with her would-be ex-employer. Four months later, Cassandra was found in a back alleyway just off Main Street, ironically in much the same condition as that in which she had once found Margot Rossi. Picked up by an officer from the narcotics detail and taken to the county hospital, her condition was diagnosed as acute narcotic withdrawal symptoms. Due to a lack of adequate facilities for handling addiction cases, Cassandra was here committed to the ward assigned to the mentally ill.
shortly after Cassandra's commitment to County Hospital, the press renewed their war of words against the city's ever-growing narcotics problem, and this time with bitter invective. City Hall countered with an appropriation to increase the manpower of the narcotics detail, and we followed up with Operation Cleanup. Starting with the bad boys of the medical profession, we picked off the quacks around town that were suspected of indiscriminate narcotics administration. By October the 4th, we had the dragnet anchored down over the entire city. The big drive was underway. clean sweep all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. But it wasn't the pure and simple case of cops and robbers that it appeared to be on the surface. To be sure, the supply of dope to be had around town diminished almost overnight. Even the pushers we didn't pick up got nervous and closed up shop for the duration. But the demand for the stuff maintained a pathetic status quo. Scores of young addicts like this became desperate for the drug they could no longer buy, beg, borrow, or even steal. The heat was on, and there was a panic in the wind. By the end of the week, the city was literally crawling with the desperation and sickness of narcotic withdrawal. November the 2nd, we ran down one of the hottest tips we'd gotten since the beginning of the big push in October. Our first lead on the whereabouts of Sven Bergman, but it didn't amount to much. It would have taken something like the assistance of the state militia to have smoked Bergman out of that complicated maze of tunnels comprising the municipal storm drain. It was about 2.30 in the afternoon that day when Bergman gave us the slip. On the other side of town, about six miles away via the storm drain, the Rossi girl waited to keep an appointment of mercy with an old friend. The Lee girl, in the meantime, had been transferred out of county hospital into a private sanitarium. The family's choice of an institution, however, had been a poor one. Inexperienced in the handling of narcotic addiction cases, the sanitarium staff sadly underestimated the perverted will and determination of the addict. Since Cassandra's release from County Hospital in October, Margot had been putting the bite on Bergman for some 40-odd dollars worth of heroin a day that was being smuggled into Cassandra at the sanitarium. After the police had tried to put the screws on him that afternoon, Bergman evidently figured the tip off the police had gotten was someone's backhanded way of canceling out a sizable debt resulting from the purchase of heroin on credit. Someone like Cassandra Lee and Margot Rossi one of Bergman's jealous competitors gave us the tip, but Margot Rossi took the rap. When Margot was found murdered, Cassandra's parents lost little time removing their daughter from the local scene. For a period of eight months following the incident, Cassandra remained outside our jurisdiction, reportedly farmed out with relatives in the neighboring community. In June of the following year, Cassandra appeared on the local scene again. The stage was a downtown parking lot, and the narcotics detail had the best seats in the house. In fact, it was almost a command performance. <laughs> Thank you. 
When Cassandra was hustled out of town by her parents in November, the girl was still a confirmed heroin addict, haunted by the incessant demands of a drug. Her search for heroin on the back streets of a new locale led her into the dangerous company of Oncello Martinez, and consequently into the middle of what we believe to be an international car theft and smuggling operation. For the past three months, we've been quietly observing the operation while systematically eliminating its stateside membership one at a time. Martinez, the ringleader, and his amigo Jimmy Sanchez were the only two left in circulation north of the Mexican border. Cassandra, who in recent months had become Cholo's woman, was now doubling in brass for some of the absentee members who had in recent months disappeared into the protective custody of the county sheriff's office. After three months of legalized kidnapping, we'd finally succeeded in forcing Cholo's hand. He and Sanchez were trying to pull a job by themselves. To this very end, we had carefully deprived Martinez of his organization of addicts and thieves. With only a skeleton crew now, composed of Cassandra, who at the moment was doing a masterful job of distracting the parking lot attendant, and Jimmy Sanchez, a mental defective, it was almost certain that Martinez would take the stolen car directly to the rendezvous point on the Mexican border, where it would then be sold in exchange for wholesale quantities of heroin. standing by, waiting to accompany Martinez in the stolen car to the border. The big game was in Mexico. Eleven hours later, Martinez, Cassandra Lee, and Jimmy Sanchez were racing across the open country north of the Mexican border, headlong into the final phase of our setup. Every highway leading into Mexico within a radius of 70 miles of the estimated point of entry was blocked by deputies from one of several border county sheriff's offices, with whom we'd been in radio contact since the time of our departure. Estimating the mileage from his last stop for gasoline, we knew that Martinez would have to make one more stop to refuel before crossing into Mexico. To carry out the rest of our plan of action, it was mandatory that we separate Sanchez from Martinez at a point somewhere near the border. The Mexican police were standing by, waiting for certain vital information we expected to get from Sanchez. Cassandra hadn't seen my happy face for more than eight months. It was quite a shock. Sanchez was certain that Martinez had sold him down the river. Under such ideal circumstances, we knew it wouldn't be hard to make Sanchez talk. When Martinez and Cassandra turned off the main highway onto one of the old dirt wagon roads leading into Mexico, we checked their point of departure on the map and made a beeline to the key roadblock, only minutes away. The original plan of action had been to allow Martinez to break through any one of the several roadblocks, at which point the sheriff's men were to have taken up the chase, tailing the stolen car into the rendezvous area in force. But Martinez had decided to make it into Mexico the hard way, across some 70 miles of open desert. In the meantime, Sanchez had given us all the information the Mexican police would need to bottle up the works in Mexico. The rest of the show is now up to the men from the sheriff's office.
While the men from the sheriff's office closed in on the old wagon road from the east and west, deploying themselves in small patrols at key positions along the road from the border north, we backtracked a few miles to the point where Martinez had left the main highway and worked our way south along the same route, closing in from behind. One hour and 20 minutes later, the patrol observing the last three mile section of wagon road north of the border could report having sighted only one vehicle in transit. And that one was ours. Then one of the patrols about 50 miles to the north of our last checkpoint spotted what appeared to be the reflection of the sun by glass in the rocks above a dry canyon wash. Investigation of the light source quickly explained why none of our patrols had been able to track the stolen car into Mexico via the old dirt wagon road. of escape, Martinez had momentarily forgotten that both he and the Lee girl were slaves to a needle. In the glove compartment of the stolen car, I found a brown paper bag containing the evidence of this potentially fatal oversight. A bent spoon, hypodermic needle, and more than a dozen bindles of heroin. Exhibit A, the oracle of impending tragedy. The temperature in the desert out there was pushing upwards of 107 degrees in the shade. The nearest watering spot, 30 miles away. Deprived of their drug under these debilitating circumstances, it would only be a matter of hours until Martinez and the Lee girl would both gradually succumb to the ascending violence of narcotic withdrawal. On the morning of the following day, we found ourselves confronted with a problem of too much desert and too little time. Using every available man the sheriff's office could muster, we began the massive yet necessary task of combing every inch of desert within a 15-mile radius of the canyon where the car had been found.
a ward of the juvenile court, Cassandra was now en route to the Federal Narcotic Hospital, there to undergo an extensive period of physical and psychological treatment for drug addiction. But in the end, there is no certainty that the results of such treatment will ever be permanently effective. Where most stories end, Cassandra's may have only just begun.